a wonderful good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar organized by Oxfirst on um, damage calculations in trademark infringement cases in the United Kingdom, or more precisely in England and Wales. Um, I have the great pleasure to introduce to you a very distinguished speaker and very distinguished chair, Professor Mark Engelmann and Professor Peter Petkov. Um, Professor Engelmann is a barrister in London and has been involved in many cases uh, regarding trademark disputes and patent disputes in a whole range of sectors. He is um, educated from Cambridge, among others, in theology um, and um, is also a scholar and has done a lot of research also for Notre Dame University. Professor Petkoff is a professor of intellectual property at Brunel University in London. He's also a barrister and a solicitor um, accredited in, in, in Bulgaria and a European trademark attorney, probably more by hobby than by profession, um, because he spends most of his time on research and uh, writing up interesting, exciting papers. Um, so Oxford, for those who don't know the company, has been now running for 10 and a half years. It is. It was started by academics like myself from Oxford University, and we thought it was important to make the linkage between exciting research in intellectual property law and economics and the needs of practitioners. So our work relates very much to um, valuation of intellectual property, damage calculations, and the management of IP. Um, they're worldwide active. We also run a big conference once a year to which I hope you'll be joining. This conference is to be held um, sometime COVID permitting, uh, second half of next year in, in, in Germany on IP and competition. We also have the next webinar lined up um, by Professor Mir Pugac uh, from the University of, of um, no, or some University in the Netherlands. Um, talking about IP evaluation. I hope you'll join that call too. I, I was very excited that so many people signed up uh, and found interest in the topic. So many experts who actually practice law in the UK, in, in England and who certainly have an interest in coming to grips with, with the damage calculation and the economics of trademark. And I think this talk will not only be around um, the current state of play, but also what could perhaps be done to improve the situation or where there are still uncertainties. But before I talk forever, I pass the floor now on to Professor Petkoff and Professor Engelmann to run the show for me while I'm peacefully sitting back and enjoying the talks. And I'll bring up your screen now, um, your PowerPoint, or I could probably also make you the, the presenter. Let me see. Let me bring it up. I think that's the safest. So where are you? Here you go. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roya, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Roya was obviously over generous in uh, uh, at least presenting me. Uh, she was certainly not uh, of generous uh, as far uh, as far as uh, Mark's uh, credentials are concerned. And uh, uh, what we do and what uh, uh, is behind this uh, uh, webinars is that. Uh, for quite some time, uh, Roy and I have been involved in trying to bring together academia and practitioners close together to really look into new and innovative ways of engaging with questions of innovation, not only uh, within the academic sector, but also in the ways knowledge transfer could uh, take place uh, and uh, connect what we do, what we write about. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, um, inform some of your ideas and some of your views, but also what we could learn um, from uh, your uh, practitioner's perspectives. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, involved in running for um, quite some time uh, uh, programs on preparing uh, candidates uh, to pass their patent trademark uh, exam so they could become uh, patent and trademark attorneys, but we have also started getting a lot of uh, solicitors and barristers who 
do want to uh, develop uh, a specific set of skills relating to intellectual property. And uh, hence, uh, um, I'm delighted that as part of this uh, collaboration, uh, we are uh, beginning to see events, but also be beginning to start thinking about uh, uh, further projects uh, uh, which uh, we could uh, do together. Uh, and uh, um, gives me a great pleasure to host uh, and chair today um, um, Mark Engelman's um, presentation for a number of reasons, because uh, uh, we have uh, a number of things in common, apart from uh, um, enjoying uh, uh, good wine. Um, uh, Mark and I uh, share passion for uh, the trademark practice and management, uh, uh, but also uh, we are also interested in law and religion and for uh, those of you who would like to hear more about uh, why should uh, uh, practicing lawyers need to know more about how uh, to leverage uh, um, intellectual property consultancy uh, in connection with uh, religious associations and cultural organizations, you better come and attend uh, one of uh, the next uh, things we're plotting together. So today uh, we are uh, not going to keep uh, the interactive format of uh, our workshops, which uh, are the formats you're probably more familiar with. Uh, uh, Mark has put together a very informative, a very interesting uh, uh, presentation about uh, damages uh, uh, in tr trademark infringement and passing off. And in a way, uh, uh, I think we should uh, indulge ourselves by following those because that they really uh, sets uh, his case quite clearly. Uh, and then we'll break up and have uh, more opportunities to kick off with some uh, Q&A sessions and uh, maybe uh, continue the conversation in a more informal fashion. Well, Mark, welcome uh, to this intellectual symposium. And uh, uh, we uh, look forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. Roya, thank you very much for organising this. And Peter, thank you for that fantastic and overly kind introduction to me. I think the greater focus is probably on my Vintner activities rather than my legal activities, which is probably true. Now, uh, Roya, I might need just a little bit of assistance to make sure my slides are working. And is it the case that to do that. Ah, I see it is working. That's fantastic. So I'll just go back. Always been a, a fear of mine when undertaking talks over um, the internet that the uh, slide presentation might not work. So let's talk about, if I may, damages in uh, these trademark cases. And as we know, in trademark law, there are two mechanisms uh, principally for bringing actions against defendants for using signs or indicia of trade. And you can see that I intend to talk about three topics. The first is passing off. Um, the second is registered trademark infringement. And then the third within registered trademark infringement is of course those three famous sections of the trademarks Act 1994, that is sections 10.1, 10.2, and 10.3. Um, and the reason I talk about those causes of action is because the word causes of action has become, I feel, highly relevant to this talk. So if I move on to my next slide. When we come to passing off, one of the early cases called uh, Draper and Twist concerned an action for passing off relating to brake lines. And I don't know whether you've got uh, any uh, images of that on the screen, but uh, the, the defendant sold uh, brake linings under the trademark of the claimant Draper. And what the Court of Appeal said that in the law assumes or presumes that if the goodwill of a man's business has been interfered with by the passing off of goods, 
damages results therefrom, he need not wait to show that damage has resulted. So that in passing off, you can consummate, and just let's remind ourselves what passing off is, it, a claimant has to develop a reputation in a particular trademark. And a defendant then, by means of a misrepresentation of some sort, usually a trade name or a packaging or get up, gives rise to a likelihood of confusion and damage in consequence of that confusion in the marketplace. But it would appear that damage is not an essential element of the cause of action in consequence of what the Court of Appeal said. So if we move on to the next slide, we realise that, I'm just going to move forward one more, I think, that with regard, let's go back, sorry, with regard to, well, actually, that slide captures it, but uh, forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be like some liberal advertising. I'm going to, I'm going to run through my slides and uh, uh, they are going to um, uh, advertise my services as, uh, as well as my hobbies uh, subliminally, like these uh, subliminal advertising uh, 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 performs. When you're watching television, you don't realise the ads are actually slowly indoctrinating you into the, the wares and the goods of the, uh, of the advertiser. But let's pause here at this slide. When we look classically at the types of heads of damages which the courts have recognised with regard to passing off, I would say to you, because this is a damage in deceit and the cause of action is in deceit, distinctive as we'll come to from registered trademark infringement, the heads of damage are very liberally awarded. So passing off is a very generous cause of action to a claimant. First of all, a claimant has claimed historically a diversion of sales of what would otherwise be the claimant's customers, those sales to the defendant. And so the claimant can claim all of the defendant's sales with respect to sale of the infringing product. And then secondly, damages awarded in respect of unlawful sales calculated, calculated on the basis that the claimant would have made those sales in an equivalent manner. There's also a further head of damage. So those two are quite, uh, as we probably all say, all say quite understandable. The third head of loss that was classically been awarded in these, this cause of action, which I say again is an action in deceit, is the loss of a network of the claimant's distributors if he loses the network caused by the loss of sales of infringing product or sales of his product that is otherwise now infringing because the defendant has conducted those sales instead of the claimant. And then there is the potential for a claimant to argue price suppression. That is a reduction on the price of his goods because he now has to compete in the marketplace with the defendant manufacturer. In, in the context of patent law, for example, we see this often in operation and very recently in some recent cases, both in Ireland and the United Kingdom in Merck, where when the generics manufacturer enters the market with respect to patented items, the patentee of the proprietary patent protected invention finds sales of his drugs and pharmaceuticals are far less than they would have been because of the presence of the first generic generics entrant into the marketplace and also further price suppression by virtue of subsequent uh, generics entrance into the marketplace. But similarly, in a normal trademark case, a normal passing off case, I should say, a reduction in the price of goods is suffered often by the claimant because he's now forced to compete with the defendant's goods, usually sold uh, at a lower price. Then there is damages which are awarded for the costs of advertisements, which the claimant would like to put out to advise the public that the defendant's goods are not those of the claimants. And those sort of costs uh, and those sort of expenses would otherwise, in the general law of damage, if we focus up for a moment and think about damages generally, the claimant has a duty not just to sit back and let the defendant run amok and do absolutely nothing, waiting for him to maximise his sales and say, hey, 
judge all of those defendant cells are mine because he has passed off his goods as those of mine, of myself, but he has to mitigate his loss and there's a duty upon a claimant to mitigate. And so the cost of advertisements, which a claimant might publish in order to advertise that the defendant, that these are my goods and those are the defendants, please not, do not be confused, Mr. Consumer. Those are part of the costs which one would otherwise associate with mitigation of damages. And then I would say, and this is a point I'm going to come to shortly, is that in passing off, because damage is awarded liberally, because the nature of the damage is in deceit rather than registered trademark infringement, which is a statutory tort, the basis of its damages is different. And therefore, you even get a claim for loss of business goodwill and reputation resulting from the defendant's goods now being present on the market. And if that damages the claimant's goodwill in any way that he can quantify, he's entitled to be awarded that too. And finally, rather attractively, the mere presence of the defendant's goods on the market which to some of you, ladies and gentlemen, might have a ring of dilution about it, the mere presence, even though those goods aren't sold by the defendant, gives rise to a claim for damages for a loss of reputation caused by that route as well. I now move on to my next slide. And I, ladies and gentlemen, I press the button, and there it is, fantastic. Uh, now, when it comes to trademark infringement, it has been said in the Ferns and Anglo-Dutch paint case that the damage are assessed more or less in the same lines as passing off. What I am going to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that whilst that may be generally true, it is not absolutely true because the causes of action are different. As I say, registered trademark infringement is a statutory tort, whereas passing off is an, an action in deceit. And as I say, uh, in that, that's that slide says, because passing off is an action, a species of malicious falsehood and deceit, it follows different lines of an award of damages. And the suggestion from the first slide is they're more liberally awarded than they would be with various additional heads than they would be for registered trademark infringement, the statutory tort. And that Therefore, when awarding damages for the statutory tort for registered trademark infringement, it follows, the cases follow general tyre rubber and fire stain rubber, which was uh, a, a House of Lords case concerned with patent infringement. I'm just pressing for my next slide. So what general tyre said is that there are three approaches towarding a damages claim with respect to patent infringement, another statutory tort in this case, is where the claimant would have manufactured um, but not sold as many goods as the defendant, the entitlement to recover damages is on a royalty basis in respect of the excess sales made by the defendant under what would otherwise be a license granted by the claimant to defendant in respect to the defendant sales. Where the claimant would have licensed, there is no difficulty, and the appropriate license fee is uh, the appropriate licensee is that to be awarded. But where the claimant would not have exploited the trademark, the cases suggest that a license fee would still have been awarded in respect to the defendant's products. Even where a claimant hasn't exploited this mark, the misuse by a defendant of a registered mark in absence of use by the claimant still results in damages being awarded on a royalty basis. And such is the same with regard, of course, that was a patent infringement case and in patent infringement, the distinction being that the claimant has a monopoly on the market with respect to all goods that are sold. And therefore, one can be certain that all of the defendant's goods would otherwise be those of the patent and invention of the claimant. So moving forward to my next slide. So again, when we come back to the passing off heads applied 
in respect of registered trademark infringement cases, we can see the same sort of heads of damages awarded. But I would suggest that the latter two, loss of business goodwill and reputation, and the presence of deceptive goods on the market is not generally awarded within registered trademark infringement cases, but it is awarded by contrast that I've indicated in uh, in uh, trademark, uh, in, sorry, I beg your pardon, passing off cases. So moving forward from there. Then we look at the question of an account of profits. And what is interesting about an account of profits as opposed to an award of damages is really they are the same species. They are a disgorgement from the claim from the defendant of profits made by the defendants on its sales in respect of its profits as opposed to the defendants um, as opposed to the claimant's actual losses so this is the disgorgement of the defendant's profits versus the claimant's losses and in some cases we all know sometimes it's better to look at what the defendant is doing and how well he sold because if his sales are quite good and his profit margins are good but if we are far rather go to the uh, defendant and look at his profits uh, rather than concern ourselves with the claimant's losses based on a license because it might not actually work out that well but what is interesting is that it is often assumed that the that these are alternatives, that it's an award of damages or an account of profits. But that position has recently changed uh, because in a high court decision not that long ago, there has been made a distinction between general damages and special damages. And just pausing there, general damages are the damages awarded for things that the claimant cannot precisely quantify, such as, if you remember my slide on passing off, damage to reputation and damage to the presence of other goods on the market, where it's difficult to quantify in precise terms what the losses are. Where special damages, however, are those which a claimant is able to evidence by presenting uh, forensic evidence to show what sales the claimant made or what sales the defendant made. And the distinction has recently been made in a High Court decision that they shouldn't be looked upon as only alternatives, that a claim can actually be made in both uh, damages and an account of profits, where the damages claim is directed at general damages, not specific damages, because specific damages is envisaged by the account of profits. That is a precise measure, if you follow me, of the sales made by the defendant, which is disgorging the profit on those sales to the claimant. So that's an important aspect of an account of profits. Forgive me, ladies and gentlemen. Now, then we come to issues about deductions, not just about account of profits, but accounts of damages in general. And this, uh, I'm very pleased to say that uh, earlier in this talk, we received some important and very useful questions, which I'm going to return to, I hope, uh, if, I, if, if we have time and if Peter and Roy allow me. But these, uh, this is relevant to the award of damages and also the account of profits because it is also be held that it's only those sales made by the defendant where profits are derived from the infringement of the trademark and with respect to any aspect of the defendant's goods which do not drive the sale allowance in the award of damages will be made for those elements so for example one can envisage in a case that let's say i see a pair of rip-off forget the pun, Levi jeans, with Levi wrongly applied by a dirty dog counterfeiter on the back of the jeans. But when I buy those jeans and I come outside the shop and I'm stopped in order to identify 
whether my sale has been made by virtue of confusion with a Levi trademark or otherwise. I turn to the interviewee who is performing the track purchase agent and I say to him, well, actually, you know, I didn't actually look at the brand. I looked at the, the jeans and I rather like them. And I thought the style of those jeans is exactly the style I liked. So I think the, the trademark played a very small role in my decision when, when, when I bought the wrong product. And therefore, it is in that type of circumstance um, that um, one will find a discount for a failure to drive the sale. In Jack Wills and House of Fraser, one of those cases cited there, it was about two peacock devices used by Jack Wills and the defendant House of Fraser on their uh, Class 25 clothing goods. And it was held in part in the damages claim that some of the sales were not actually driven by the use of the trademark, but actually by the design of clothing. So that is an important deduction that the defendant can argue for. Just moving forward. So similarly, we see that in another case, Shampoo, Louis Reuter and Garcia Carrion, where again, the use of the trademark crystal and the competing goods, which were in this case, champagne, uh, it bottled champagne, uh, as uh, Peter pointed out, a, a product very close to my own heart, probably too close to my own heart to be quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, the, the point is that Crystal did not form the overriding an overarching criteria that made a consumer choose the defendant's champagne over the claimants, but actually simply because the defendant's goods were cheaper. And that was the motivating force which caused to a proportion of the sales not to be accredited to the claimant in respect of, of damages and or an account. Just moving on. Bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. So then we get to this rather interesting issue. And I, I want to draw you back to where we started, which is about how passing off arises by action on deceit and therefore damages as assessed liberally. And then we come to the statutory torts, um, which are sections 10.1, 10.2 and 10.3. And what I am asking you is in most of the previous cases where you're looking at, like the General Tyres case, the Firestone case, where you're looking at whether a royalty should be granted in respect of all types of trademark infringement, irrespective of where, from where the cause of action is derived. I would say to you, there is a distinction, ladies and gentlemen, between the three sections of the Trademark Act 1994 and their counterparts in the directive, because just for a moment, section 10.1 we know is all about confusion. It's an identical mark, identical goods or services, and confusion is assumed. The statute doesn't even say that. The cause of action is identical goods or identical services. Section 10.2, which might raise its own query, actually, ladies and gentlemen, but I think most people would accept that the reason it says no more than that in the provision is because it is an assumption that con confusion is, has been uh, assumed to have taken place. With regard to Section 2 of the Trademarks Act, now moving on to that section, it's an identical or similar mark with respect to identical or similar goods and services, and the claimant then has to go on to prove that there was a likelihood of confusion. So there you can see the act of the consumer becomes operative in causing the loss envisaged by the section, the damage, and confusion is operative. But when we come to section 10.3 cases, the course of action is different because we know when it, the damage envisaged, the three types of damage envisaged by Section 10.3 cases is unfair advantage, tarnishing and or dilution. Now, unfair advantage, you might say, well, that is pretty close to confusion because the acid test of an unfair advantage successful 10.3 case would be where the, the, the claimant could show that members of the public who bought the defendant's goods were in fact confused. And that is an archetypal example, paradigm, if I might say, example of unfair advantage, trading off the coattails of the claimant's reputation. Tarnishing, on the other hand, is a different matter entirely. And I hope at the back of your minds, both with respect to tarnishing, which is damaging the reputation of the claimant's trademark, its distinctiveness, and also dilution, 
which is damaging the distinctiveness of the claimant's trademark because of the existence on the, in the marketplace of other uh, goods, including particularly the claimant's branded goods, there you're looking at anything but confusion. In fact, the test following uh, a case that I was involved with, which was CPM Corporation and Intel, was that all a consumer had to do was to establish a link and associate, call to mind the defendant's mark to trip the threshold of liability. But then, of course, Intel established that the claim has to actually establish and prove the actual damage, those three types of damage, unfair advantage, tarnishing or dilution. So really, I suppose the question I would ask is when we always assume a royalty based on a registered trademark infringement case, are we really to continue to do that? Because it is not confusion taking place, but something less than confusion, a mere link or association. But we, if we were to do that, does that mean the claimant, so we don't pay a royalty on those sales, as the courts currently do, but a, a, a canny defendant starts to argue that the same principles as the Dunlop case should not apply, then the the or the general tires case should not apply then isn't the type of damage more akin to the damages we see in passing off which is deceit whereby you get awarded damages for goodwill damage to the goodwill of reputation and a very dilution like type loss which is the presence of the deceptive goods on the marketplace so that poses a question for you ladies and gentlemen and I just, before I move on to my next slide, also wish to, so there I've just set out, and I don't think you really need to see it, but those are the three sections in question. But I pose really two, two issues that result from this sort of analysis, which is that a trademark owner, if, they, if it is at all possible, should always run a passing off case an action in otherwise an action in deceit for the purpose of maximizing his trademark damages because of the very general and liberal way damages are awarded in those types of cases as well as and alongside their registered trademark cases and for the wary that's for the wary claimant and for the wary defendant they should be saying to themselves, I wonder which way this might work out for me, that maybe if I can argue section 10.2 and 10.3 not to apply to the royalty type cases that have been transposed to trademark law from patent law, I should argue that a different test should apply and maybe I should go back to the passing off heads of damages in order to make a special damages assessment for damage to reputation by tarnishing and or dilution as contemplated by the CPM decision. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that hasn't been too exhausting for you. And thank you very much for listening. And it's just that as it, as it fires forward, it did there for a moment to my last slide. Um, and I would like to go back. Oh, it's almost there. Um, oh, sorry. I'm not quite there. It's just a delay. Um, so just quite helpful if it stays. I hope it's <laughs> going to stay there. There's a gremlin in the system, ladies and gentlemen, forgive me. And gremlins always happen. Um, but y y when we come to that tarnishing and dilution, and I know I promised you an early uh, end of my talk, I just wanted to bring you back just to make sure to the Spalding and Gamage case, uh, which is the loss of goodwill and reputation. And that was pure passing off. And what you can see there is lost reputation. It was a 1915 case of so a don't be shocked by the figures. But when the when the claimant was first awarded £2,000, the the damages award was increased on appeal to £7,000 purely for lost reputation. And it was well accepted within that case that the presence of the defendant's goods on the market gave rise to another claim quite separately, as I said, which is very dilution like. So, ladies and gentlemen, unless the slides are going to slide forward any further, we are um, now open to any questions you might have. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, um, if this was uh, the customary colloquium we usually hold in our garden when the weather is nicer and warmer, we only have a rule that we start at a particular time, but uh, no rule when we're going to finish and we carry on for as long as we feel like it. But obviously this is a webinar which is organized for uh, very busy professionals and uh, time is limited. So now we have an opportunity to uh, discuss uh, um, uh, the paper, which was fascinating, very interesting, and I uh, have a number of questions, but uh, perhaps I should abuse my role as the chair and fire off the first question. Obviously, the uh, interdependence between passing off and statutory uh, infringement rules is quite unique for English law. And I was just wondering whether you could reflect further on the uh, question of how damages, awarding damages uh, for trademark infringement translate across the pond. Are there European and uh, um, uh, continental, continental European and English uh, uh, perspectives which uh, uh, could be described as differentiated in this respect? Is there European vis-a-vis -vis English approach to awarding damages? Peter, what I would what I would say is I can't um, uh, tell you whether I've looked um, too carefully at the cases on damage award of damages with respect to, for example, unfair competition causes of action. But, it, but your question raises quite an important issue, which brings me back to the very beginning of where we started with the question of what is the cause of action, because. That question is a very, sounds like a very dull question, but the, the question at its very outset has a number of repercussions for a number of things in law when you classify the cause of action. For example, limitation period is very much affected by a cause of action. Jurisdiction is very, very much affected by the nature of the cause of action and the Brussels Convention to the extent it still applies to the United Kingdom. And the situ of the, the intellectual property right is affected. You might remember Lucas Films, that where you have a copyright infringement case, the United Kingdom courts have, can, it's judiciable within the United Kingdom because unlike registered rights, it, it, sovereignty can't be exercised by a foreign court in the United Kingdom. And I know like I sound like I go off point, but the final point is damages. And damage is very much affected by the cause of action. So for example, if I look at breach of contract, the damage is what would the claimant derive had the contract been performed? Registered trademark infringement by comparison is what would the claimant have, have been awarded but for the act of the defendant's infringement? So it's a different approach to the cause of action. In deceit, damage is assumed. So for example, damage is assumed. And coming in a roundabout way to answer your question, Peter, and you might think that might have been a long time ago, forgive me, is that in European jurisdictions, we have generally the principle of unfair competition. Now, unfair competition is not quite the same cause of action as deceit, which is passing off but it is much closer, believe it or not, to a cause of action under the European Directive in breach of the Trade Secrets Directive is now considered by the court to be an act of unfair competition. And so the heads of damages should, by virtue of the type of cause of action, be different. And so the corollaries should not necessarily be the same. Peter, I haven't answered your question directly, but if you can get the gist of where I'm going, I hope. I'm delighted that uh, you answered it the way you answered it because uh, indirect answers are sometimes uh, far more exciting and uh, more entertaining than uh, 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 the straight answers. And we're already beginning to receive questions from uh, the audience. Uh, I have uh, anonymous attendee. Uh, I'm sure that uh, we'll find out uh, who our guest is. Uh, it sounds sounds almost like, uh, like a medieval manuscript, but... Uh, uh, if a passing off is an innocent or negligent, why should damages track those in the intentional tort of deceit? 
Well, that is that is that is a very good question. Um, and um, so one must recall that innocent or negligent passing off is irrelevant to the cause of action because intention within the rubric of passing off is irrelevant. So whether you're negligent, reckless, whatever other form of, of, of mental state you're in when you pass off your goods as somebody else's, it is strict liability. And therefore, in short answer to the question, the measure of damages is exactly the same. Thank you, Mark. And um, another question, uh, obviously, passing off and statutory uh, infringements uh, um, intertwined in a rather interesting way, and you presented that uh, very convincingly in your presentation. But uh, I was just wondering um, whether you could reflect on the fact that while we could see the, this historic evolving and interdependence between statutory tort and, and passing off uh, as far as uh, 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 trademarks are concerned, uh, where does the future lie? I mean, looking at the case law which is emerging and the dates uh, of the cases, we could almost say that most of the passing off cases, with very few exceptions, are historic cases, uh, which probably suggests that passing off is uh, on the decline, partly because uh, um, uh, uh, of the increase of registered rights. But I mean, how, how do you see the future of this uh, um, um, overlap and interdependence between the approaches in passing off and, and statutory tort, which you hinted about, uh, if uh, hypothetically passing off may actually fade away one day and becomes uh, more of a historic curiosity rather than a relevant uh, area of trademark law uh, protection. Well, Peter, I, I, I mean, I, I'm going to be the first, like, forgive me, I, I'm going to be the first to, to query why one feels passing off will disappear, because it's been around for a very long time, and it protects those with unregistered rights. Um, so the the query as to whether it will actually disappear, you know, the, the assumption upon which the question is based, I, I would probably try and attempt to deconstruct. If anything, following uh, Brexit and the 2008 withdrawal agreement, um, it is a, an entirely domestic right. It has uh, no real parallel in European law. And if anything, and don't get me wrong, because this is not a statement about politics, Peter, let me tell you. But it is, if anything, it's probably, at least within the United Kingdom, going to uh, continue as a species as a cause of action. But assuming, as you say, that the, our future world is about people registering trademarks around the world, um, then I think um, the what I what you actually point out with Peter is there are very few cases on very few cases on damages generally throughout history. I, th I feel it's fair to say that. And one wonders whether there really does need to be some refinement and approach based on this cause of action principle, rather than what has happened in many cases, uh, a, a sort of borrowing of principles from what sounds similar, you know, passing off to register trademark infringement sounds quite similar. And look, it's quite similar to patent infringement. So let's apply the same principles. But I think the error in that is when we start to see cases under, for example, the Trademarks Directive, which are an entirely different cause of action again, in unfair competition, we should see a change in the way damages are assessed in those types of causes of action. And I think the, the more different types of intellectual property infringement that are now created with time will force the courts to focus on the principles to be applied cause of action by cause of action in relation to these types of cases. But it might take some time before we see cases get to the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, but if I could uh, uh, take you further on that, uh, uh, in, yeah. in some of your uh, comments, uh, it, it's, if I understood them correctly, there was an implication that one could almost uh, uh, approach things through the route of the passing off more effectively and perhaps in a more intellectually coherent way when one uh, uh, approaches infringements. Uh, 
actions. Yes, you're right. And uh, uh, and if yes. uh, uh, I was wondering whether I could take you further on that, if if we take the approach that uh, uh, passing off, uh, whether it it has an existential raison d'être or not in terms of new cases coming coming on, uh, uh, passing off remains a very effective backup. Uh, uh, plan uh, for uh, infringement when you apply statutory infringement and and basically keep a passing off as a, as a backup um, uh, strategy. If this is the case, uh, uh, I was just wondering whether you see from a purely theoretical point of view that uh, whether there's likely to be a, a fusion between passing off and and the various tests we have developed uh, in. Uh, uh, in the application of infringement and defenses, that that passing off would would kind of almost or, organically uh, intertwine with uh, uh, the, our approaches to statutory torts uh, and defenses. Well, Peter, yes, forgive me. Um, from a, from my conclusion to the talk was from a strategic uh, perspective. If a claimant could possibly argue that it has passing off rights, which in most cases of registered trademark infringement, these two causes of action run in parallel, um, then you are far better set to ask for that liberal approach to damages that arises from deceit, and I'm cautiously saying fraud, than otherwise would arise um, from a breach of a statutory tort. Now, your second part of your question, which is, I think, where you were heading in when you asked your first part of your question, which is that is the future, is there, is there, is there a merger in principle? And I would say, Peter, the answer is that merger is in existence because the courts do merge the two principles and do not go through the intellectual dissection of seeing, as, seeing them as two different species or causes of action. And therefore, they apply that royalty basis on registered trademark infringement cases and passing off cases and probably seem to intermingle the two to some degree. So if you've got a pure registered trademark infringement case, you're doing quite well when a judge uh, starts to apply passing off heads of damages to registered trademark infringement cases. But uh, likewise, um, it does appear to be the case that the courts going forward are tending to merge the principles and say, well, passing off is just a species of registered trademark infringement, when in fact that simply isn't correct, I think, in my humble opinion. And uh, uh, we've got another uh, question from our guests. Uh, and uh, I love the format of uh, uh, the Zoom webinars because this is beginning to look like a medieval gloss, kind of commentaries in the margins of uh, uh, of the conversation. Uh, uh, Mark, do you want me to read it or can you see the question yourself? Um, I I think it might be good if you could read it. Do you mind, Peter? That's a long um, question to read. Uh, it's okay. Uh, it, I is have read it. Do you want me, do you want yeah? me to? Can, can everyone to see it? Is there any aversion from English courts to afford the plaintiff remedies app applicable to unregistered trademarks if that plaintiff has a cause of action arising from the registered trademark rights? It appears to me to be a situation in which there will be virtual ground on instituting a suitable cause of action in a UK court for securing damages based on deceit, even with limited activity in the UK while pursuing conventional statutory approach in other jurisdictions. Does registration and enforcement of registered rights in one jurisdiction act to stop other causes in other jurisdictions? Right. So <laughs> I think I think the tenor of the question is that registered trademark rights are a better a better method of protection than say passing off. Would that be a fair um, resume of the question? So yes, what I think, answer? I think that's and you forgive me if I haven't. Whoever asked that question, forgive me if I've not answered it. Or I've not really. I think um there is one very valuable additional protection a registered trademark gives you, which an unregistered uh trademark doesn't give you. Uh, and that is that if you're not, that you can generally in most jurisdictions of the world apply for a trademark and you have five years. 
uh, give or give or take within which to hold on to a market around the world of the 270 potential commercial markets around the world and you can sit on your trademark rights for five years and do absolutely nothing the problem with passing off and unfair competition rights but in, in parallel with registered trademark rights is of course you have to use and exercise your right to develop a reputation for the purpose of getting a any generally speaking this is fair across all jurisdiction a reputation for the purpose of having any cause of action and with regard to young entities in other words companies corporate entities that are just kicking off into the marketplace they need to preserve their overseas territories even before they make a single sale or even before they advertise to those territories so answering and i hope i have done the generality of the question forgive me if i haven't because it might have been slightly lost in translation that there is a very great importance in having registered trademark rights because often a company can simply not and it's not cost effective to supply its goods and market its goods to jurisdictions around the world if I might, just for a moment, Peter and Roya, just whilst we still have time, I'd just like to talk about Roland Mallinson's question. Uh, if I, if would I be allowed to do that? Because Please Roland go. sent it. Maybe, maybe you could paraphrase it because I don't think he asked it again here. No, I shall I read it out? Yes, yes. Uh, Ro Roland asks, um, and I've just got it on my screen. First of all, he asks, he, asks, uh, he asks three questions. The first question is, I hope you're well. Roland, I am well. Thank you very much. And that's very cheeky of me, forgive me. His second, his second question, sadly, is not as easy as the first question, which is effectively that if you have a consignment of goods and only half have been sold by the defendant, do you calculate profits, if it's an account of profits, on a product by product basis? And can you offset, offset the cost of supply and manufacture against the revenue received by sales? So I can answer that bit of the question first, which I hope has become apparent from the, the slide presentation that, pro, that the, it is every sale, I think it's fair to say, every confusing sale gives rise to a cause of action for either an account or damages. They are, as you know, two different ways really of saying the same thing. And that the defendant is entitled to 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 make deductions from the I, I, the 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 uh, let's say the end user price of the manufacture of the products because of course you're only looking at his profits in account of profits claim. And then the question goes on to say that what happens to the other half of the goods which are unsold and i like the question roland because it hits upon precisely what these the tenor of my talk is about if your cause of action is in passing off you have a claim for the unsold product even though they're not on the market and haven't been sorry they're on the market one assumes but have not been sold so they're unsold but under passing off because it's an action in deceit you in principle have a cause of action for the mere presence dilution of those unsold consignments on the market and here is a paradigm example of a case where you should run passing off and registered trademark infringement together to make sure you sweep up the unsold products but there is another aspect to the unsold products, let's say in this consignment you're talking about, which I assume is in a container on a, hopefully a ship, but for COVID on its way to some country somewhere. And that is to say that, of course, if your claim is against the importer, then your cause of action for damages or an account of profits is against the importer. And as to the manufacturer, he has a separate profit margin and if you join him to or it to the action, you'll have a separate claim for damages and or on account of profits against the manufacturer. So even though the money and this is in registered trademark infringement and passing off. And so if the manufacturer's products are unsold, he has still sold them on to the importer and he has made a profit on those sales. So um, depending upon, of course, where those sales take place, you, the claimant, has still have a cause of action there. 
And I'll be very brief. Roland asks a third question. Um, uh, and I think you, I think your third question really embodies my answer to your, to your second question, which is that the act of manufacturing is an infringing act, as you rightly say. And as you rightly say, the way things stand at the moment, because the courts don't dissect or distinguish between passing off and registered trademark infringement, um, the sales, there would be a notional royalty under the general principles on bet sales either by the manufacturer or by the importer in respect of each product. The, the question that goes on about, about the other remedies under passing off a registered trademark infringement, namely delivery up and destruction. Clearly, if you deliver up and you destroy goods, they no longer remain on the market and therefore no sales are conducted in respect of them. So I hope, Ro Roland, I've answered your questions, but if I haven't, um, then please contact me. But this master of the case law you cited was very old, early 20th century. Is there any need for yes. updating? Or does, are there just some principles which hold over time and the story? And, and I also wonder, I have heard a lot about the law, what about the economics? Um, how are these principles translated into economic calculations, estimates, etc. How regularly does this come up or how do the courts deal with that? Right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna address your first question about the age of, 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 of uh, Traper and Trist and Spalding and Gamage and those old cases. The, the answer to that question is that passing off was a creature of domestic legislation within England and Wales and therefore the passing off has developed over time, as we know, to encompass all sorts of cases like one in a million, which is only about re the wrongful registration of domain names. But it shows that passing off is a flexible remedy. Um, and, um, and so the fact the cases are old, given that there are limited uh, cases and judgments relating to quantum, I don't think disbars passing off, given its ancient heritage as a cause of action in deceit, remaining good law irrespective of how old those cases are. Your second question relates to the economics. Well, the, the, the word economics has a particular ring, I would say, with regard to section 10.3. Of, of, the, of the Trademarks Act 1994. And well, if assuming that's that's Roy, how how you meant that word to 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 be uh, engaged by me. But when one's talking about economics, I mean economic effect, particularly with regard to ten three cases, needs to be proved, and it needs to be proved and established by an expert such as yourself, Roy, forensic accounting experts who can analyse uh, the economic effect of such nebulous concepts as damage to reputation, free riding and tarnishing. And so um, when Intel ultimately said, um, CPM, Intel and CPM ultimately decided that the, the, the serious consequences envisaged by Section 10.3 need to be proved by evidence that you couldn't just allege them, then that evidence, given that it was um, an American economist who came up with Section 10.3 in the first place, it is unquestionably, in my opinion, that if you want to establish damages under Section 10.3, it is a, an economist and or a, a particularly a, 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 a forensic accountant that would need to give evidence to establish that those types of damages have been caused. We still have a few questions. Huh? Do you still want to address them or we could? Okay, well, one says thanks, Paul. Then maybe that one we could still address. Could you explain more how the information from a customer who got the pair of pants without being mistaken by the label is relevant? And section 10.2 does not require actual confusion, but merely a likelihood of confusion. Um, right. So, um, I mean, it's a good, good, it, it giving rise to a likelihood of confusion, that section, I wish I had the section in front of me, maybe I should look it up. But, um, 
but uh, the reality is that ultimately for for the for the tort to the statutory tort to be consummated you have to establish damage and we all know that um that the, the the i think the words likelihood of confusion was to permit a claimant who uh is subject to uh the damage caused by infringing goods on the marketplace but before actual confusion has arisen the right to proceed with the cause of action but i think at trial up so of course in order to get an interim injunction however at trial it is absolutely essential for for the claimant to establish actual damage we all know the famous moron in the hurry uh, type judgments where um, a judge might not be confused by the multiple witnesses going through the witness box giving evidence as confusion if the judge himself and confusion can only be determined by the judge himself not by the witnesses he's he the the witnesses evidence provides weight but is ultimately a decision by the judge whether confusion has arisen it is once the judge has formulated a view of co confusion then it is again back to the claimant to show what those what sales either were diverted away from the claimant or on an account of profits what profit the defendant made by his sales but confusion is an essential element well uh we are um reaching the end of this uh, webinar um uh, because unfortunately like all good things uh, eventually they'll come to an end uh, um it's a great uh, opportunity to remind uh, our uh, guests uh, uh, that uh, we look forward to hearing from you should you wish to uh, be involved in one form or another in this format of uh, exchange between academics and practitioners on issues of intellectual property. If you, you want to do something together with us in the future, do let me and Ryan know about it and uh, we'll get together and plot uh, uh, how to bring uh, uh, the two worlds uh, together in a meaningful way. And uh, I would like to uh, thank Mark for uh, being with us this afternoon and for Roya for making this happen. Uh, I hope that uh, you take uh, as much stock as I did uh, from uh, Mark's presentation. And I look forward to, to meeting you again at our next uh, webinar together. And Mark, I look forward to plotting more things uh, with you in the future. Uh, thank you. Very much. And thank you. have a wonderful week. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very thank you. much. Bye.